I didn't really know too much about what I was getting myself in for, so I just thought, don't go in with any expectations and you'll be pleasantly surprised. I didn't know what to expect really, and what I got was a really refreshing conversation with a lot of genuine, friendly, kind people who are all coming for the same reason, just to, to get some answers. I always knew that the Alpha course was there, but I never really considered doing it. And then I thought to myself, I'll go and see what happens. My sisters decided that they was going to do an Alpha course. I was like, okay, well, if you do, I will. <laughs> so I was like, I get out, away from the kids once a week. I get food and I get to have a conversation with good people about interesting things. Let's do it. First night was really cool. It was a really relaxed atmosphere. I met some really good people from day one, and that was the reason I came back for the second week. It's such a great, open environment. You don't feel like you have to walk on eggshells. You can speak your mind. They made it clear at the beginning that maybe they didn't have all of the answers, but you should definitely ask all of the questions. Okay, good morning everybody. Good morning. Okay, let's try that again. Good morning everybody. Good morning. Uh, I'm not going to shout too much today. We've got, three, we've got three sessions. I've got two in the morning, so I've got to really preserve my voice. Uh, it's just been battling a bit through the last couple of weeks. So um, I keep it kind of low key, so I'm not going to be like a Pentecostal preacher up front here. Uh, over the course of the day. It's a beautiful, beautiful day. It's just, you know, what we needed for a day like this. Uh, we think of the rain, we think of God's, God's outpouring of His Spirit, and it's always a reminder of His gentle rain upon His church. And we pray that we would experience the rain of His Spirit come upon us as we wait on Him, as we come expectantly and Perhaps some of you here this morning come with some trepidation, uh, maybe some fears, uncertainty, uh, you're not quite sure what to expect. And I just want to reassure you there's really nothing untoward that's going to take place today. We just got to wait on God, let God do his work in our hearts, uh, and we'll talk more about that later. Uh, for the first two sessions today, we're going to be looking at who is the Holy Spirit, and then we're going to be looking at uh, what the Holy Spirit does. And so we're going to kick off. I trust everybody's got their notes in hand. If you haven't, they're all on the tables. Uh, so just grab your notes if you haven't got any. Uh, and let's just go through the scriptures and start uh, filling in stuff. Has everybody got a pen? Have everybody got something to write with? Anybody need anything to write with? Uh, can we just organize some pens, please, in the office or wherever, just so we can give them out? Okay, they're coming. Thanks, Lydia. Uh, if you need a pen, please raise your hand. Anybody need a pen? Okay, it looks like everybody's covered. Otherwise, it's too embarrassed to say they didn't come prepared this morning. Okay, let's just bow our heads in a word of prayer, shall we? Lord, we just thank you for this lovely day. Thank you for the beautiful rain that you've given to us. We've been so desperate for rain, Lord, and it's just the rain falling is, is such a blessing, Lord. If, if that's all we, we receive today, Lord, we know we've received a blessing. But we know you have much more in store for us because, Lord, you want your spirit to come and fill us afresh today and to remind us of those things that you taught Jesus. And we pray that you would just open our hearts to understand more about this third person of the Godhead. And so... Bless every person here and just fill our hearts with your peace and your joy. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, basically, 
there are two responses to the person of the Holy Spirit over some time now. I think in the church, the Holy Spirit was really rather ignored. There was a great concentration on God the Father and God the Son. And probably until about the 70s, the, the Holy Spirit was not a person of the Godhead that was focused on much. I think the Holy Spirit is often misunderstood. Maybe something to do with the fact that the, the original 1611 King James Version always referred to the Holy Spirit as the Holy Ghost. And kind of the word ghost obviously sounds a bit creepy, a bit eerie, and you know people weren't quite sure of what to make of this Holy Ghost. So the Holy Spirit has been ignored, but the, the second response has been that the Holy Spirit has been resisted. I heard of one church in central London that was a very formal church and didn't give much room for the Holy Spirit at all. And there's a woman who had just become a Christian and she was just so ecstatic and so excited about what God had done in her life and, and how, what she had experienced in the Holy Spirit and in the middle of the service she she couldn't contain it anymore and she just shouted out hallelujah and there was this very stern looking church warden who was standing at the back and he came and tapped her on the shoulder and he said madam you mustn't say that here and she said but I'm just so excited I'm just so overjoyed I found Jesus and he said to her well you didn't find him here madam now you get churches like that. Believe me, I grew up in an Anglican church where that could well have been the case. I even remember the church warden as clear as it was yesterday. A very stern looking guy with graying hair he used to stand at the back as large as life. He was quite a big fellow. And you really felt that you couldn't even raise your hands or anything that was out of, out of sync with the rest of the congregation. So the Holy Spirit is ignored and the Holy Spirit is resisted. So who is the Holy Spirit? Well, let's just go through a number of things which are really important. And I think, I really believe that through the session today and this, this afternoon, you, you'll come to know probably more about the Holy Spirit than 80% of people in churches today. And so get ready just to receive and to learn what the scriptures say about who the Holy Spirit. And I really pray that it will alleviate not only your fears, but give you a lot of insights as to who he is. Okay, number one, he was involved in creation. The Holy Spirit was involved in creation. Some people think the Holy Spirit is like a 21st century phenomenon. But he's literally been around since the creation of the world. And that's where we start looking this morning, at the creation account. And we're going to be looking through these next two sessions at really the history of the Holy Spirit, beginning from Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 and going all the way through the Bible until Revelation chapter 22 and maybe missing out the odd verse here and there but we're going to start from Genesis and go through to Revelation and get a complete picture of who the Holy Spirit is so the Holy Spirit was involved in creation so let's look at Genesis 1 verse 1 to 2 it's in your notes uh, so let's just read it together in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth now the earth was formless and empty, darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Almost like a bird hovering over a nest, waiting. And that's the Spirit of God was about to bring something new into being. The whole Trinity were involved in creation. We read of God the Father the Creator created the Word, the world through His Son, Jesus Christ, by His Spirit. And the Spirit of God, we read, is hovering, waiting to bring something new into being. The Holy Spirit brings order out of chaos. He brings about the cosmos. Out of confusion, He brings harmony. 
Out of deformity he brings beauty. Out of oldness he brings newness. And yet the Holy Spirit, we read, is hovering over the waters, waiting to bring new things. Just as the Holy Spirit today wants to bring something new into your life, when the Spirit comes, he always brings something new. He brings new attitudes, new desires, new hopes, new ways of worship, new ways of expressing that worship. I think it's true to say that for the most part we are quite conservative with a small c by nature. Sometimes we're quite cautious about new things, we're cautious about change. Change is always difficult, especially in the church. I heard of one church leader who'd been a leader in a church for 46 years and someone said to him goodness me over those 46 years you must have seen so many changes and he said yes and I've resisted every single one of them you know I certainly have met lots of guys like that who resist every change you have I, I heard of one church where they they were the worship leader was very keen to to move the 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 keyboard or the piano in that particular church from the one side of the church to the other. And so they decided it would just be too much of a change for the congregation. So they, the pastor agreed that she could move it one foot at a time across the stage. And so from the beginning of the year, at the end of the year, it was then on that side of the church and nobody actually realized that they had moved it to the one side. Well, that's unfortunately how it often is in churches. You've got to do things very slowly, and uh, otherwise people jump up and down. And we, yeah, in fact, we're going to be talking about something around this in the next few weeks in our church, and so get ready for that. The Holy Spirit is always wanting to bring something new because he's a creator spirit. He was involved with the creation. In Genesis 2, verse 7, he brings life to human beings. Let's read how that took place. The Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. The Hebrew word for the Holy Spirit in Genesis 1 is a word called ruach. It's actually like R-U-A-H, and you would say it as ruach. It's almost like you, you say it as if you were breathing it's like ruach it's like a, a breath it's similar to the word that is used here for breath it's literally talking about the breath in the old testament this ruach this breath of the holy spirit which is the same word that we often read about in the old testament for the holy spirit just as when god gave human beings physical life He breathed into them his ruach. So they didn't only have physical life, they weren't only created in his image, he then breathed his spirit into them. Later on, Jesus would breathe on his disciples and he would say, receive the Holy Spirit. One of the things that happens when the Spirit of God comes to live within us, and of course, The Spirit of God is all of our Creator, but He also has a special relationship with those who are Christians, those who have given their lives to Christ. The Holy Spirit comes and dwells within us and breathes that life into us, that spiritual life into us. And often when that happens to someone, you can almost see a change in their countenance. You can see a change in their their, their, their whole um, just being, they, they light up, their eyes start, start shining. There's almost like a deadness in their eyes before, and the Holy Spirit comes and fills them and just gives them a newness of life. And we're going to be talking a lot about that a little later on. And the same goes for churches. Some churches just seem to be very dull and dry and barren and lifeless. And the Holy Spirit comes upon that church and suddenly there's just a a lightness in people's steps. There's a joy. You can see it on the faces of people. There's just an outpouring of joy upon them. And so the Holy Spirit brings life. 
The very important thing to understand in the Old Testament is the Holy Spirit came upon particular people at particular times for particular tasks. Let's just have a look at a couple of examples here. Let's look at a guy called Bezalel. Uh, if you look at Exodus chapter 31, verse 1 to 5. Exodus 31, 1 to 5. I wonder if I could just get a copy of the notes, please. I just want to know what scriptures are in the notes and which ones aren't. If we could, please grab a Bible, folks. Let's just spend time today. We've got the whole day together. We don't have to rush uh, through anything. And so let's spend time looking at scripture. It's all well and good to look at notes, but it's better to, to rather look at God's word together. So I was saying my Bible has vanished. Let me grab it. So if you can turn to Exodus chapter 31. Somebody read that for us, please. Anybody? Exodus 31. Could somebody just stand up and read that? Verse 1 to 5. Then the Lord said to Moses, See, I have chosen Bezalel, son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with skill, ability, and knowledge in all kinds of crafts, to make artistic designs for work in gold, silver, and bronze, to cut and set stones, to work in wood, and to engage in all kinds of craftsmanship. Okay. I've chosen Bezalel. I've filled him with the Spirit of God, capital S, with skill, ability, and knowledge in all kinds of crafts. So yeah, the Spirit of God came upon a person for artistic work. And you see it today, when the Spirit of God comes upon a person, it gives something different to what they create. There's something just extra special about what they create. And this is for artistic work in this case. But it really applies to any kind of work. The Spirit of God can, can bring a, a, a newness, a, a different dimension to our work. Now, not everybody is called to full-time ministry, to full-time work. But we are all called to be filled with the Spirit at work. And that makes a huge difference when we start working in the power of God's Spirit and not just in our own strength. So here we find the Spirit comes upon a particular person at a particular time and gives them that ability to do all kinds of crafts. And then we read about a guy by the name of Gideon who becomes a leader of Israel in Judges chapter 6 and verse 14 to 15. So if you're going to turn to Judges 6, verse 14 to 15. The Lord turned to him, that is to Gideon, and said, Go in the strength you have, have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? But Lord Gideon asked, How can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. The nation of Israel had been overrun by the Midianites. And the country was in desperate need. And God sends Gideon to be their leader. And Gideon says, Lord, you've picked the wrong person. I can never do this. How can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest and I'm the least in my family. He felt totally inadequate, ill-equipped. And God says, no, I've called you. I want you to go. I want you to set my people free. Now, how is he going to do that? We look at verse 34. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. The Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. 
and he became a great leader of God. Now this is the amazing thing about the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes upon a man or a woman, he can transform us from being timid, feeling inadequate, and he can actually fill us with courage and boldness to do what we would never dream of doing. And so in this case, the Spirit of God came upon a particular person, Gideon, at a particular time to perform a particular task, that is, setting his people free from the hands of the Midianites. So then we turn to a figure that we know so well, Samson. In Judges chapter 15, verse 14, Now we all know the story of Samson being the strongest man around and his, you know, downfall at the hands of Delilah and so on. But in verse 14 we read, As he approached Lehi, the Philistines came towards him shouting, The Spirit of the Lord came up, shouting, The Spirit of the Lord came upon him in power. The ropes on his arms became like charred flax, and the binding dropped from his hands. So in this case, again, a particular time, a particular person in Samson, and God gives him almost supernatural power. Maybe just to pause here for a moment, and I think this is really important. So often we find something described in the Old Testament in a physical way has a, a spiritual understanding in the New Testament. So Samson was bound with ropes. He was bound physically. And when the Spirit of God came upon him, he was able to break free from those ropes with physical power. When we come to the New Testament and beyond, so many of us may find ourselves bound, not in a physical way, but in a spiritual way. Bound by habits, patterns of thought, addictions. And the Spirit of God can come upon us and enable us to break those chains or those ropes of bondage, as it were. Sometimes it's obvious things like drugs or alcohol or some other addiction. But maybe it's other things. Maybe it's something that is not as, as bad as that. Something like a bad temper or envy or je jealousy, anger, immorality of some kind, impurity of some kind. And the Spirit of God wants to set us free. And tonight when we pray and ask God's Spirit to fill us, those are some of the things we are going to be praying that God would set us free from. Things in our lives that that the enemy has a hold on and we need to be delivered, we need to be set free from some addiction or something that's really got its hold on us, stranglehold on us. And we pray and ask God's Spirit to come and literally break those chains in the same way that Samson was able to break the chains that bound him. Now that may happen in a moment for example, as we pray tonight. But for others, it may take place over a long period of time. But the Holy Spirit comes to give us strength to live the kind of lives that deep down we, we're longing to lead. So we have Bezalel, we've got Gideon, we've got Samson. Then we have Isaiah. Can you turn to Isaiah chapter 61? you turn to the middle of your Bible, you get to the Psalms. And if you just flip over a few books, you get to Isaiah. It's around about page 830 odd. 834. Let's just read that together. It's such a, an amazing text.
The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me. Because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. Now, prophecy in the Bible is not so much forthtelling or foretelling as it is forthtelling. So often people think that prophecy is merely foretelling something in advance, but it's actually forthtelling. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. In other words, to bring the message of hope to those who are poor to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives. In other words, to make a difference in our world. The experience of the Holy Spirit is not just that we should have some kind of nice, warm feeling in our hearts and feel good. The experience of the Spirit is in order that we should go out and make a difference in the world, to transform the society in which we live. And the interesting thing to me is that in the Old Testament, whereas the Spirit of God only comes on particular people at particular times to perform a particular task, every time he does that, something happens. Something is transformed. And as you go through the Old Testament, there's kind of a, a build-up, there's a rising sense of anticipation Whilst in this instance it's an individual who gets maybe supernatural strength or an individual who gets a gift of leadership, as you go through the Old Testament there's a sense that the Holy Spirit's got to work with, with a whole group of people and indeed entire nations of people and transform those nations. That is what is referred to as the promise of the Holy Spirit, the promise of the Father. And the whole of the Old Testament, in fact, is a promise about what's going to happen in the future. So that leads us on to number three, that the Holy Spirit was promised by the Father. So what exactly is this promise? Well, let's turn to Jeremiah chapter 31 which is the very next book after Isaiah, Jeremiah chapter 31, and let's look at verse 33. Again, an amazing text. Okay, we all there? This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbors and say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. Okay, so in the Old Testament, under the Old Covenant, the people of God were given the law. Remember, Moses was given the law, tablets of stone. And they looked at these laws and they said, wow, these are great laws. Don't kill, don't steal, don't commit adultery, don't covet, honor your mother and father, and so on. And the thought was if they lived by those laws they would have a, an amazing society. And they tried to live like that. But the problem is they found that they couldn't live like that because they kept on breaking the laws. And so the law, instead of it being a blessing to guide them and direct them and show them what was right and wrong, 
It actually became a burden to them. They were trying desperately to keep the law, but they kept on failing. And God saw this. In fact, God even predicted this. It doesn't mean the law was wrong. It doesn't mean the law was bad. It just meant that keeping the law was in your own strength is very difficult. And there are a lot of people today who go to church who think that's, that's what they're going to do. Live this good life. Live to the golden rule, as it were. And they find it really difficult to do. And the more they fail, the, the, the more guilty they feel, the more condemned they feel. And so you have... I've spoken to so many people who say, yeah, I ask them, are you a Christian? Yeah, I am a Christian, but not a very good one. What do you mean by that? Well, actually, because I, I just kind of do a lot of wrong. I mess up a lot of times. I'm not a good Christian. Folks, there's no such thing as a good Christian. There's no such thing as a bad Christian. There's a Christian who is spirit-filled, and there's a Christian who is trying to live the Christian life in the energy of the flesh. And you just can't. You become like the people of Israel, trying to comply to laws that are on tablets of stone, rather than comply to the law that's written on your heart. And God says, I'm going to do something new. This is going to be my promise. Instead of the law being on the outside, something that you're trying to keep but you continually fail, I'm going to put that law on the inside. I'm going to write that law, not on tablets of stone, but I'm going to write it in your heart. It's a bit like different attitudes to jobs. Some people have jobs they hate. And I don't want you to raise your hand if you hate your job, but the chances are many of us would raise our hand. And I think in my life I've had jobs that I really hate and I've had jobs that I really love. And you have different attitudes to that depending on which it is, whether you hate or do you love it. I was showing somebody yesterday a a picture of my daughter in Madagascar on, on the yacht living the life, you know, jumping off yachts into the sea and, you know, wakeboarding and uh, diving and all this kind of thing. And I just remarked to them, man, you know, to have a job that you really love, this is the kind of life, to love cooking and yet to love like being in paradise. That must be the ultimate job. I remember when I was at Varsity, I shared the other day that one in 37 of our class got through to final year. And so because I had failed that third year, it was only one out of 12 subjects, but at Vits you failed the whole year because of one subject. It was a ridiculous system. But I had to repeat a whole lot of subjects that I hadn't got over 60% for. I lost my bursary, so I had to find a way of trying to get myself to university. And back in the day, we're talking about, what, 1980, 7980 or so, uh, computers like Apple's were just coming in. I mean, we used to use mainframes at Varsity. There's no such thing as a PC. And I went to Rio Tinto, and they gave me a job of capturing information from magazines, mining magazines and metallurgical magazines, and capturing it on like a spreadsheet, but not like a spreadsheet like we understand spreadsheet. It was, a, it was a, like a spreadsheet. It was on a document with a whole lot of little blocks that you had to fill in. And you would write the title of the article, you would put in the author, you would put in what it's about, uh, the, 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 whether it's copper or zinc or palladium or whatever, and you would put a whole lot of key words what the article was all about. Maybe it was about furnaces, maybe it was about ore dressing, maybe it was about some aspect of metallurgy. 
and you'd put the page numbers and all this stuff was on this thing and then somebody would then take that and capture it on their mainframe computer and the idea was that if anybody wanted an article on copper they could go to their mainframe and it would tell them which magazines had an article about copper in it. I mean it was, a, it was an incredible like database but as archaic as you can imagine. I mean there was no such thing as Microsoft back then. So I used to walk from university which is in Bramfontein all the way to Marshall street in town in Joburg. I used to walk. I didn't have a car. I walked all the way there and I used to come home with massive bags of these magazines which weighed a ton and I would be crawling along the road all the way back to my flat and I'd have to work tediously through every single magazine and basically read every single article which you can't do but just get an overview and fill in these forms. It was, I tell you, it must have been the worst job I've ever had in my life. I remember I got paid per hour, I can't remember what it was now, but 100 rand an hour or whatever it was, and I had to put that money aside, I couldn't go and spend it and have a jewel on the weekend with it, I had to put that money aside and pay for varsity fees. And it was really tough, you know, to do that. And apart from the fact that I didn't have transport, and on the odd occasion when I managed to borrow a car, it was bliss to go there and fill the boot with all these magazines and go back to the flat. So you get jobs that you like really hate, and that's etched in my memory like you can't believe, and other jobs that you really love. And, you know, I love my job now. It is an absolute passion because God has called me to do it. But there are a lot of people who don't enjoy their jobs. And God, in a way, says, it's going to be like that. Compared to the old and the new, you, you're not going to keep the rules because you have to keep the rules. You're going to keep the rules because you just want to, because my spirit is going to be in you, and my law is going to be in your heart. And you're not going to do it because you have to, because you desire to do it. So how does God do that? How can the promise of the Father be fulfilled? Well, let's turn to Ezekiel chapter 36. It's in your notes there. So let's just, let's just read that together, shall we? This is what God says. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit, again, capital S, in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. I mean, what an incredible prophecy. This is God speaking long before Pentecost that we read about in Acts 2. I will give you a new heart. That's how he does it. By the Holy Spirit coming to live within us. Jackie Pullinger was an amazing person. She, at the age of 21, went as a missionary to the walled city in Hong Kong, which was an area of about 60,000 people living in a place where there was just no law, where there were prostitutes operating on every corner, where gangs operated, where drugs were being bought and sold and so on. I mean, it was a hectic place where she went to. She went as a young girl of just 21, and she went on her own, and she started ministering in this incredibly dangerous place. And she saw so many people come to Christ through her ministry people being set free from drugs and addictions and, and prostitutes giving their lives to Christ and living a new life and so on. She once spoke at a conference and she began her talk by saying this. She said, God wants to give us soft hearts and hard feet. But she said, the trouble with most of us is that we have hard hearts and soft feet. And by soft hearts, you really meant hearts that were filled with compassion, with love. And by hard feet, you really meant feet that were willing to go anywhere for the gospel, for the sake of the gospel. 
Our hearts are often hard. We are sharing on Sunday in terms of witnessing Christ. We read that Jesus went, and as he went, his heart was filled with compassion as he saw people as sheep without a shepherd. And we said the sequence is very important, that Jesus first went, and then his heart was filled with compassion. Our hearts are so hard that we don't even get to go because our hearts are so hard. But sometimes if you were just willing to go and to see the people out there who really need Christ, who are really desperate, who are in such a broken world, your heart would be softened and you would then have a heart of compassion towards those people. There's nothing more moving than seeing that take place in a person's life. Somebody ministering to drug addicts and seeing a person's life that's really messed up and just being transformed by the power of the gospel. But the Lord's got to do that work in our hearts first to get us to the place of actually ministering to those people. So that really was the promise. And who does the promise apply to? And to whom is this promise going to be fulfilled? Well, have a look at Joel chapter 2. Again, it's in your notes, so let's just... Read it together. It's an incredible, again, passage of Scripture when you think that it was written probably a thousand or so years before Christ. God says, I will pour out my Spirit. I will pour out my Spirit on some people. No, only special people. Only people belong to Willow's Methodist Church. No, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Now listen to this. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. In other words, sons and daughters. It's regardless of sex. Well, let's change that to gender, okay? In case you misunderstand. Regardless of gender, your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Again, it's regardless of age. Even on my servants. It's irrespective of background or status, race, color, or rank. Even on my servants, both men and women, there we have the gender again, I will pour out my spirit in those days. In other words, it's for everyone, on all people. And that's the promise of the Father, friends. And yet this promise remained unfulfilled. As I said, probably for a thousand years, the people were waiting, and they waited, and they waited. Hundreds of years went by. And then at the birth of Jesus, it's like a trumpet sounds, and everyone connected with the birth of Jesus is filled with the Holy Spirit. Let's just turn to some of these scriptures. Now you can get back into the New Testament. Have a look at Luke 1 verse 15. Could somebody read that for us? Luke 1 verse 15. He will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from birth. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from birth. Speaking of John the Baptist. Let's look at Mary in verse 35. The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. So the Holy Spirit will come upon you. He's speaking to Mary. So here we find at the beginning of the New Testament, suddenly the Holy Spirit that had been promised for so long, now was coming upon those around the birth of Jesus. Read verse 41 for us. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. Who was Elizabeth? Okay, so here we find Elizabeth is now filled with the Holy Spirit. So we've got Mary, 
We've got Elizabeth, we've got John the Baptist, and even Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, verse 67. His father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied. So here we find the beginnings of the all people that the Holy Spirit is now coming upon. So, John the Baptist links the Holy Spirit with Jesus. We're still in this era of particular people at particular times. And John the Baptist is the first person to make the link between the promise and Jesus. So let's turn to Luke chapter 3, verse 16. Let's turn over a couple of chapters to chapter 3, verse 16. John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but one more powerful than I will come, the thongs of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. He, that is Jesus, will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Now baptism in water is important, but it's not enough. Jesus is the, is the Spirit of baptizer and in the secular Greek the word baptize really meant to overwhelm to immerse to plunge to drench those are the words that we we read of to overwhelm to immerse to plunge to drench it would be used of a of a, of a ship that had sunk the ship was actually baptized it was overwhelmed there was water inside and outside and that's what the Spirit of God wants to do, friends. He wants to drench us. He wants to saturate us. He wants to fill us. Jesus himself was completely full of the Holy Spirit. Have a look at verse 22. Classic passage of Scripture about the Spirit coming upon Jesus. The Holy Spirit descended on him, that is on Jesus in bodily form like a dove. So the Holy Spirit came upon Jesus. Chapter 4, verse 1. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit. Verse 14, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Holy Spirit. Verse 18, he says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach good news to the poor. That's the very quote that we read from Isaiah 61. So the Holy Spirit came upon Jesus. Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. And the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. So we find the Holy Spirit at work in the life of Jesus at the outset of his ministry. So John the Baptist makes the connection between the Spirit and Jesus. Then Jesus predicts the presence of the Spirit. Have a look at John chapter 7, verse 37. Please turn to John 7, verse 37. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. How does it go? Bless thee. The, ble the bed that I rest on. Went to bed with his stockings on. I haven't heard that one, but anyway. Okay, so John chapter 7, verse 37. On the last and greatest day of the feast, we're talking about the Feast of Tabernacles. Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty There's a thirst, isn't there? There's a thirst in every heart. Not just a physical thirst. We all have a physical thirst and it can be satisfied by just drinking water. But we have a spiritual thirst which can't be satisfied by anything physical, material. It's a spiritual thirst. And Jesus says, if anyone is thirsty, 
Come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scriptures have said, will have streams of living water flowing from within. Come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me will have streams of living water flowing from within. There's that drenching, that outpouring. Literally, it's out of their innermost being will flow rivers of living water. He says, not only will I satisfy your spiritual thirst, but then you will become a source of blessing, a source of life for others. And water, of course, in that context, I mean, we're talking about a society is living on the edge of a desert. They knew that they were absolutely reliant on water for everything. In that very barren kind of place. And water symbolized life as it does today. That's why today is so appropriate that we have water falling around us, reminding us of who the Holy Spirit is. And Jesus is saying the Holy Spirit brings life. It means that when we're filled with the Spirit, the life of the Spirit flows through us to others. And other people are able to come and drink. And he continues, By this he meant the Spirit, which those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time the Spirit had not been given, since Jesus had not been glorified. And when John speaks about Jesus glorified, he's obviously talking about the cross and the resurrection. And some of the very last words that Jesus said to his disciples at the end of Luke's gospel were these. He said, I'm going to send you what my Father has promised, the promise of the Father, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. And we're going to be looking at this passage tomorrow. Jesus ascended. And still the promise had not been fulfilled. And they waited. And we read in Acts 1 verse 4 to 5. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for my father, for the gift my father promised, which you heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Verse 8. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And still the promise of the Holy Spirit is not fulfilled. And they waited. And they waited for ten days after the, after the ascension. Ten days. And all the time there's this rising expectation. It's like... You know, shaking a champagne bottle and eventually releasing the cork and the thing just explodes. That's exactly what we have here. And in chapter 2, verse 2, the cork flies off. And we read, and this is going to be our text tomorrow, suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them, not just particular people at a particular time to do a particular task, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. The promise is fulfilled. And the people's reactions around them were mixed. Some people said, oh, that's absolutely amazing, this is wonderful. Others, verse 12, were amazed and perplexed. In other words, they were amazed, but they were confused. They were perplexed. And yet still others, in verse 13, made fun of them. And they said, oh, they've had too much wine. People are drunk. In other words, something amazing happened, friends, that they weren't able to really understand and really explain. 
So they gave a natural explanation to something that was actually supernatural. And Peter then gets up and he says, let me explain this to you. These people, verse 15, these people are not drunk as you suppose. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. No, he says, this is, this is the promise. This is biblical. This is what was promised all along in the Old Testament. That in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. And then he says something even more amazing in verse 37. He says, this is for you. This is for you. And we read, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. There we have it. And then he says, the promise is for you, every one of you. And the promise is for your children. In other words, not only those who are here, but every generation. And for all who are afar off. For all whom the Lord our God will call. This is the amazing promise of the Father. The gift of the Holy Spirit is no longer for particular people at a particular time to perform a particular task. It's not just for leadership or strength or wisdom or prophecy. The Spirit of God will come upon all people. And the promise is for you and for you and for you and for every single generation, for all people. We now live in the age of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is for all of us, friends. The Holy Spirit is a person. The Holy Spirit's not a ghost. The Holy Spirit is a person, the third person of the Trinity. And the Holy Spirit comes to dwell within us, to empower us, to, to fill us to, with his joy his peace, to drench us, to change those hard hearts and to soften them so that we, in turn, can bring life to the world around us. The Holy Spirit is not a power or a force as some kind of mystical thing. The Holy Spirit is a person. The Holy Spirit is God. And the Holy Spirit wants to come and live within every one of us. Now after lunch, we're going to be focusing on what the Holy Spirit does. And we'll come to realize that the Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit dwells within every believer. A person who doesn't have the Holy Spirit does not belong to God. So if you're a Christian, if you've invited Christ into your life as part of the package, as it were, the Holy Spirit comes to dwell within you. So the Holy Spirit is within every believer. But as we'll see a little later, it's not a matter of whether the Holy Spirit is resident in your life. It's whether the Holy Spirit is president of your life. The Holy Spirit may be resident, but is the Holy Spirit president? Does the Holy Spirit control you and everything you do? Or is it still you in control and you driving the car and God's Spirit is as resident? God's Spirit wants to take over the control of your life. And I pray this afternoon as we look at the role of the Holy Spirit in our lives, and tonight as we start looking at how we can be filled with the Spirit, that we will just kind of let go and 
release everything into God's hands and allow God just to do that work that he can only do on the inside of us. So let's just bow in a moment of prayer and then we're going to invite you just to go to your tables and maybe just uh, spend some time just chatting about some of the, the ideas that we've spoken about who the Holy Spirit is before we break for lunch. So let's bow our heads, shall we? Lord, we just thank you for who you are, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There's such mystery around the Holy Spirit. We confess, Lord, it's not something we can easily grasp. But Lord, we know that your Spirit comes upon us, your Spirit fills us, and your Spirit empowers us to do your perfect will. I pray, Lord God, that you would just give us a deeper understanding of who your Spirit is. And Lord, as we lead into this afternoon session to understand more of what he does in our lives, may it become clearer to us that this is not some mystical doctrine that we are talking about, but this indeed is the person of the Spirit who wants so much to, to infuse us, to empower us, fill us, drench us, and change our hearts from being hard to being soft, and our feet from being soft to being hard. This is our prayer, Lord. Begin that work in us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.